Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our event. Um, this is our traditional careers in criminal law panel. Um, and this is the first event that the Dalhousie Criminal Law Students Association is holding this semester. Um, so we do appreciate uh, you being here today. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, my name is Sierra Mateo and I'm a 3L student at the Schulich School of Law. Uh, and I am the current co-chair of the DCLSA. Um, before we get started as well, I just wanted to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, here today and every day, we are treaty people. Um, to give you a bit of an overview of what the evening is going to look like, um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists that have joined us today. Um, and then we'll be jumping into a discussion about their careers and career journeys in criminal law. Um, and if you do have a question um, that isn't touched on by the prepared questions that we have, please feel free to ask it in the chat and uh, I will do my best to get to it. Um, so starting off, um, our first wonderful panelist is Justice William Horrigan. Um, Justice Horrigan is a graduate of the McGill University and Osgoode Hall Law School and the former chair of the litigation department at Faskin Martineau. Uh, he has a distinguished career in law and public service, having served as the Chief of Staff to the Attorney General for Ontario, uh, as Counsel and Director of Issues Management for the Premier of Ontario, and recently as Commissioner on a Public Inquiry into the Ottawa Light Rail Project. Uh, Justice Horrigan was appointed to the Ontario Superior Court in 2009 and elevated to the Court of Appeal for Ontario in 2013. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, tonight as well, we also have the Honorable Judge Elizabeth A. Buckle. Uh, she has been a judge of the Nova Scotia Provincial Court since 2015 and currently sits in the Long Trial Court in Halifax. Elizabeth has been the president of the Nova Scotia Criminal Lawyers Association and represented the association on many committees and criminal justice initiatives. Uh, she is an active member in several notable national and provincial committees and programs including serving as vice chair of the National Education Committee for the Canadian Association of Provincial Court Judges. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Elizabeth. Um, next, we also have Scott Miller as one of our panelists. Uh, Scott is Crown Counsel with the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, uh, a graduate of the Schulich School of Law and a part-time faculty member. Uh, his practice surrounds largely the prosecution of white collar crime, including fraud, tax evasion, and immigration fraud. Um, Scott has also argued cases at all levels of court in Atlantic Canada. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening, Scott. Uh, next, we have Josie McKinney. Uh, Josie is Mi'kmaq and Wolostoquy. Uh, she is a proud alumna of the IB and M initiative at the Schulich School of Law, class of 2006. Um, after her call to the bar in 2007, Josie uh, provided Indigenous legal services at the University of Ottawa Community Legal Clinic for three and a half years. Uh, she's been a Crown Attorney since 2011 and currently specializes in human trafficking prosecutions. Um, our fifth panelist is Paul Shepard. Uh, Paul is a graduate of the University of Leeds School of Law in West Yorkshire, England. Uh, during law school, Paul worked with the Innocence Project, advocating for the wrongfully convicted in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Uh, called to the Nova Scotia Bar in 2015, Paul spent a short time in private practice before joining the Nova Scotia Legal Aid Youth Office. Uh, his practice has consisted of youth criminal justice, family, social justice, and child protection matters uh, concerning secure treatment. Uh, Paul also sits on the board of directors for the Community Justice Society. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for joining us tonight. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we are joined by Sarah White. Uh, Sarah has been practicing in the area of criminal defense for almost 10 years and was first introduced to criminal law uh, as a law student at the Dalhousie Legal Aid Clinic. Since then, Sarah has worked primarily in private practice, but also at the Nova Scotia Legal Aid and Dalhousie Legal Aid. Uh, she is currently a graduate student at Dalhousie while also continuing to practice criminal law. And her graduate research thus far has focused primarily on sentencing. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for joining us this evening. Um, just a bit of a disclaimer as well. Uh, you may see a couple Paul Shepherds joining us here this evening. Um, we do only have one Paul Shepherd here tonight. <laughs> I am the real Paul Shepherd. <laughs> 
So um, I guess to launch into this, as this is a panel uh, regarding careers in criminal law, um, it might be helpful to have the panelists begin um, taking turns describing your career journey, leading from law school to the role uh, that you play now in criminal law. And also no order, um, however you feel comfortable jumping in. <laughs> You should probably assign an order. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you feel comfortable going first? Sure. Um, so can, it, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, it's great to see all the panelists. They, uh, I think, have all appeared in front of me, but I don't see them very often, so it's nice to see them. Um, my path was very linear, but not really planned. Um, I realized probably in first year law school that I wanted to do criminal law. So after that, I essentially took every criminal course that was available, including the criminal clinic. Um, then against the advice of everyone, I only applied to article in criminal firms and got a job articling in a criminal defense firm in Toronto. Um, I went there for articles and was told that there was no chance of a hire back. So I sort of thought, well, I'll figure it out after I get uh, my articles, but I was able to stay there. So I stayed there for about five years. So I practiced in Toronto for about six years in total. Uh, then I moved back to Halifax kind of on a, a leave of absence because my, my husband um, had gotten a temporary job offer here with this hour's 22 minutes. So I, thankfully my firm in Toronto gave me a leave and I came back and started working with actually the guy that I'd done the criminal clinic with here. And then we ended up really liking being back in Halifax, so we stayed, and I continued in criminal defense work um, until my kids were little. I had two kids while I was in private practice, which is a bit of a challenge because you don't have mat leave. I took um, four months with the first one and eight months with the second one, and then decided that when they were really little that I just wasn't doing a great job with either my practice or my kids. So I thought that if I maybe went to the Crown Office for a while, it would be a, a better choice. I wouldn't have to work so hard. So I went to the Federal Crown for about four years, and I really enjoyed that. I really learned a lot, but it just it wasn't the right fit for me. So I went back to criminal defense work in the same firm that I'd been with before and stayed there. So in total, I guess I was practicing for about almost 20 years before I applied to the bench and you know none of what I did was for the purpose of a judicial application because I never really thought I would apply to the bench but the choices all kind of when I was sitting down to fill out the application they all kind of made sense so I had criminal I had defense and crown background I had done a lot of legal education not not because I thought I was going to apply but just because I was really interested in it. I enjoyed it. It was a great way to network and get to know other lawyers. So I never had a grand plan to apply to the bench, but the things that I enjoyed doing um, turned out to, I think, make me look like a good candidate, at least on paper. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about any of that, um, but that's sort of how I got to where, where I am now. Thank you so much for sharing, Elizabeth. Um, we'll get into it a little bit later, just about the work-life balance part, but um, I'm curious to come back to you uh, just with your decision to switch to the Crown. Um, Josie, would you like to go next in describing your career journey from law school to where you are now? Sure, and don't mind the fluff in the background. It's my dog who only cares if I'm on Zoom. Um, <laughs> I think he's jealous. Um, so uh, I... Um, my journey was unexpected in the sense of I went into law because I wanted to be able to affect change for Indigenous people. My parents were both very politically active um, in the Indigenous officer of Indigenous community. And um, I saw myself, uh, I thought I, would, I was going to be a politician. That was what I, I expected to, to do. And I thought, well, a lot of politicians seem to have law degrees and the law is, you know, historically been oppressing our people. So I'm going to get a law degree and then I just won't practice. I will just use that as a foundation. And um, when I started at law school, I did very poorly in criminal law. <laughs> um, did very poorly just generally in my first year of law school. Um, 
and almost quit on many occasions and didn't quite frankly feel as an indigenous person um, welcomed or, or that I fit uh, at law. Um, but then I uh, got a job with, um, after my second year of law school um, with the PPS, uh, Nova Scotia Public Prosecution Service, they had a uh, summer student position for Indigenous Black and Mi'kmaq Initiative students. So I went into that and really, really enjoyed um, criminal law, um, being in a courtroom, never again, never expected myself to enjoy litigation and being in court all the time, um, really enjoyed it. And what I learned um, both, and at that time really enjoyed both the concept of both criminal, uh, sorry, both defense and crown work um, and saw a real absence of indigenous presence in that area of practice. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, in light of over incarceration rates, um, you know, overrepresentation of our women um, as victims of crime, violent crime specifically. I thought this is a space that I, you know, I could make a difference. And then I just applied for every criminal job, um, defense or crown I could find across the country. Um, and one that um, opened up was, uh, that was of the most interest to me was at the University of Ottawa Community Legal Clinic, which is a teaching clinic, just like Dow Legal Aid. Um, they were looking to start um, Indigenous legal services and they needed an Indigenous staff lawyer to create that program from the ground up. And so um, I applied for that job. I thought it was a super interesting opportunity. So I went there. Um, it was not just criminal defense work, although that was a huge part of the practice, um, but there was also tied to the criminal defense work were um, doing civil litigation um, against policing agencies for unlawful arrest and excessive use of force, um, claims under the Indian residential school settlement process, uh, criminal injuries compensation and tenant rights. Um, and so we just developed, I just developed the, the services as the community needed. Um, I coached their Kwaskaman uh, moot team. I did a lot of community development work and community training sessions um, and just really, really enjoyed that. And then um, when the project ended after three and a half years, they unfortunately couldn't get it funded long term. I once again threw those applications out all across the country. And uh, the one um, that uh, piqued my interest was coming back to Nova Scotia, uh, this time in, in Yarmouth. It was Yarmouth Crown Office was hiring. And I'd never been to Yarmouth before in my life, but it was closer to where I'm from, which is in New Brunswick, and, and applied for that. And was in Yarmouth for a year, Shelburne for five years, and then transferred to Halifax. Um, and then eventually into special prosecutions, um, starting off only for a few months doing um, internet child exploitation. And then when the human trafficking, and they created the new human trafficking prosecutor role, um, I felt like it was the perfect opportunity to combine everything I had learned so far, um, you know, uh, dealing with gender-based violence, which is a passion of mine, um, as well as um, issues of race in the criminal justice system. So, um, and then creating something new, um, which which I had done in Ottawa and was excited to do it again for here. So that's sort of where I've been in the last two and a half years and our human trafficking team has grown by three people. And it's been uh, hands down the most rewarding work that I've been able to do so far in my career. Thank you so much for sharing, Josie. Um, I know you touched on a lot of criminal justice and social justice pieces in your past. Um, and I think we'll be getting into that in a little bit. So I may dig a little bit deeper into, uh, into those projects of yours. Um, Paul, how do you feel about going next? Yeah, it's no problem. And just let me know if the, uh, the jackhammering sound uh, well, is a little too overbearing. Um, yeah, so, um, so I suppose I, I decided that, uh, that I wanted to pursue a degree in law um, while I was studying uh, my undergraduate degree. I took a psychology and law class. And uh, I remember we were shown a, a documentary about a gentleman that had been wrong, uh, wrongfully uh, convicted in the United States. And, uh, you know, they talked about the, the different lawyers that had worked on this case. And I thought that just seems like the most in, incredibly meaningful thing for somebody to do uh, to advocate for people in, in a position like that. Um, fast forward uh, a couple of years after I finished my, my undergraduate degree. Um, 
speaking with a friend who was uh, who had already begun law school in the United Kingdom at the University of Leeds, um, I discovered that they they had an innocence project at this school, um, and uh, and so it, in my mind it was a it was a great fit. I wanted to travel. Um, I think I was probably 24, 25 by the time I applied to law school. So I felt like if I wanted to do some traveling and pursue a career in law, then um, maybe try and do some of those at the same time. Although I'll be honest, once I got there, <laughs> it wasn't so much time to travel. Uh, um, yeah, so so after law school, or I should say dur during law school, uh, I started volunteering, uh, shadowing at the uh, Public Prosecution Service in Nova Scotia. Um, Andrew McDonald, who was the uh, chief crown at the time, uh, invited me to come and shadow him. Um, I ended up getting connected with uh, Rick Woodburn. Um, and uh, I, I continued volunteering throughout law school every summer when I came home. Uh, it was all unpaid, of course. Um, so in the evenings, I had a job at a radio station just across town, uh, doing promotions and live broadcasts from various nightclubs and uh, places around town. Uh, you know, I look back really fondly, you know, I was going pretty full tilt at that point because uh, I'd, I'd do a full day, uh, maybe write briefs and memos for, for Rick and other crowns and then I'd go to my job at night. And, um, so, uh, so anytime somebody studies outside of, uh, of Canada and they want to come back to Canada and, and practice, um, there's a conversion process. So that's something that I had to do. I had to submit all my credentials and uh, I was assigned a number of exams. Uh, and I had to complete that before I could begin articles. Um, so I graduated, moved back to Halifax, submitted my application. Um, and rather than, um, you know, simply continue to volunteer, I actually applied to be a legal assistant at the, uh, the prosecution service. Um, and I was hired and I, and I spent the next, uh, the next six months studying for exams and uh, being a legal assistant to, to four Crown attorneys in uh, Halifax Provincial Court. Um, and I think fortunately, because of the relationship I built there, um, although I was, you know, I was, I was there primarily as a legal assistant, uh, some of the Crown attorneys still had me write briefs um, and do file assessments for them. So I kind of got the opportunity to continue learning while I was doing that job. Um, passed all of my conversion exams. Um, at this stage though, I, I didn't have articles secured. I suppose studying abroad, I kind of missed out on, on some of the career um, networking opportunities here in Halifax. Um, so, uh, you know, I ended up doing my articles completely, almost completely unpaid. Um, I, I put it together myself. Uh, I spent uh, nine months at the PPS, two months at uh, Pink Larkin, doing a little bit of labor employment and as well working with Joel Pink, uh, seeing the defense side of, uh, of things. And I spent a, a very brief period of time at uh, HRM Legal Services. Um, yeah, and uh, when I finished that, I, you know, I, again, I, I didn't have employment secured. At that point, uh, I was hoping to get a job at PPS, but uh, there wasn't to, opportunity there. So uh, I literally just went out and, and got a number of business cards printed up, uh, paid my insurance, um, and uh, went down to the courthouse. And uh, I, uh, I suppose most of my work in that first six months was uh, municipal prosecutions. Um, I had uh, a couple of legal aid clients. I had a couple of uh, per diem days where I would do cells and duty counsel at legal aid. Um, and in fact, that's how I ended up here. I just happened to come into legal aid on a day uh, to pick up a file for a client. And there was a short-term contract available uh, here in the youth office. Um, and uh, I pretty much accepted it on the spot. And the rest is history. So I've been practicing here in this office now for about eight years. Um, I was transferred to the family law office for a year which was a, a very interesting experience for me, not having a great deal of, uh, of interest or expertise in, in family law, but I learned, I learned fairly quickly. Um, and yeah, so my, my practice now consists almost entirely of uh, criminal defense, although uh, we still from time to time get involved in secure treatment hearings uh, for youth and care system up in the Truro area. 
Um, and, and really in terms of social justice, we get a young person walk through our door uh, that has a legal issue that we think we can help them with and that we're competent to help them with and we'll, we'll do our very best to do so. Yeah, so that's my story. Thank you, Paul. Um, so Paul and I do know each other um, through pro bono, so it's been really interesting to uh, to learn your history, uh, which I didn't know a lot about. And I may come back to you in regards to uh, your experience with family law and labor employment law, uh, just when we're talking about how other areas of law have helped you uh, in the criminal field. Um, next, uh, Justice Horgan, if you feel comfortable uh, sharing your career journey um, leading to the role you're in now, um, I do apologize for the technical difficulties we've had at the beginning of this, but I'm glad you were able to join us. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for having me. Uh, my experience is a little different because I didn't practice criminal law. When I was in law school, I worked as a probation and parole officer in the summers. I was really attracted to criminal law. I thought it was terrific. Uh, but at that time, about 100 years ago, when I graduated, uh, we all marched from Osgoode Hall to Bay Street uh, in unison, and we all got Bay Street jobs. People, there were very few of my classmates who were doing criminal. And uh, I think uh, I, I missed an opportunity there, because if you're at a big firm on Bay Street, you're not getting the kind of on-your-feet work that you get at a, a criminal shop. In any event, uh, I practiced there for a number of years. I, I went uh, and worked in government because I did have some interest in criminal law policy. I worked uh, with the provincial government in Ontario and dealt with uh, civil forfeiture. We were going after organized crime. We were creating legislation about that. It was rewarding and I enjoyed it, but eventually I went back to practice. And um, a few years later, I was appointed uh, in Central West, which is west of Toronto. Uh, the main court building, not the one I worked out of, I worked out of Milton, but the main court building is Brampton, which is the busiest criminal law uh, courtroom in all of Canada. So I got a crash course about uh, jury instructions and about criminal law cases. And essentially uh, it was, two to three years of just learning on the job. And I loved every minute of it. We, we would finish a case, I would instruct a jury, the jury would go out, I'd move to the next courtroom and I'd start another one and we'd keep doing it. And, and I really learned a lot and I really uh, enjoyed being in the courtroom with criminal law lawyers. They were very passionate, they understood what it was they were doing and, and they were motivated for all the right reasons, both on the Crown side and the defense side. So I really enjoyed that. When I went to the Court of Appeal, um, that really helped me uh, because we see a lot of uh, cases where people are complaining about jury instructions, about you know judge alone errors. And I, I lived through a lot of that and I was fortunate enough to have people around me who really helped me. So. I really enjoy the criminal law side of what I do day in and day out. I think, uh, you know, you, you'd expect that somebody who did a lot of civil litigation would be more interested in that. But I'd we sit in weeks, criminal or civil. I, I'd rather a criminal week than a civil week anytime. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, the, the quality of the advocacy from the criminal law bar that we see day in and day out is second to none. It's people who really understand the law uh, there, get to the point, make interesting arguments, have an ability to focus on what's important. And so for that reason, I, I'm really attracted to the criminal law. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's really interesting hearing uh, just your story um, about this shift to Bay Street. And I think similar to Paul, I may so circle back to that when we talk about um, maybe some parts of your journey that you wish you could have done differently. So thank you. Um, Scott, uh, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, so I, I don't know how much guidance my journey, as it were, is going to provide anyone, but it may offer a, a tale for everyone as to how you can sort of fall backwards by pure accident into something great. Uh, my, up until I was about 30, early 30s, I was going to be a poet. I wanted to be a poet. 
I had no interest in the criminal law or any law whatsoever. Uh, but I was beginning to learn by my mid thirties that I wasn't a very good poet. Uh, and uh, around the same time, I was getting more and more into uh, the animal rights and animal protection movement. And I had been reading uh, a, a few books in particular by uh, people who had, uh, had uh, uh, lawyers who had devoted their careers to animal rights law. And I thought, I wanna do that. That's what I'm going to do. So I decided uh, that I was going to go to law school and become an animal rights lawyer. And I went and found some LSAT practice tests and I did them and I wrote the LSAT and I eventually uh, moved back to Nova Scotia to go to Dalhousie Law School. Uh, and, you know, I started an animal law society and, uh, and I got together with some like-minded friends, but learned very quickly that uh, I had not considered far enough ahead as to how anybody might make any money as an animal rights lawyer. And I had a young family by this time and uh, no money and nor did anyone in my young family. So I, like most people did in first year law school, I think, and probably still do, I just applied to every conceivable job I could apply to. Uh, and uh, I had some interviews uh, in first year with some of the big law firms uh, uh, in the city in Nova Scotia, and I had a couple of second interviews, and I went to dinner uh, with uh, one of the big firms, and I remember they, you know, as I'm sure they still do, uh, they always have, you know, they say, okay, well, we're going to call, you know, we're going to call the people that we hire on, uh, you know, Sunday morning uh, by 10 o'clock. You'll get a phone call if you're, if you're in, and I sat around uh, I sat at that phone all morning uh, and, you know, 10 o'clock passed and then it was 1030 and I was still sitting there by 11 and it's this incredibly empty feeling. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone else in the panel has experienced it. Uh, I expect uh, some people listening have and others will in the future, but it's uh, it was, uh, you know, a, a really a, a bad day for me that I remember really well. And that was the end of my first year. I ended up working that summer uh, doing some research for a prof. And then in second year, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, the Federal Department of Justice hires their article clerks. Uh, at least they did at that point. They didn't hire in first year. They waited until second year and hired us then. And so there was another round of places to apply. I applied there. I had no particular interest in, uh, in the work that they did at that time. Uh, but uh, I got an interview for that and I went in and uh, they hired me. So I ended up articling with the Department of Justice. They have a rotation with the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, uh, which was my first rotation as an article clerk. And uh, I, uh, I absolutely loved it. On the first day, uh, it was, uh, I, I just couldn't believe what a, uh, what a great, uh, job this could be, and how, I, I think I just missed Elizabeth. I think you left. I'm not sure what year you left, but it was a year or two maybe before I joined. Uh, um, and that's not why it was good. I'm sure it was. Uh, I'm sure it would have been good if you were still there as well. But uh, <laughs> in any event, it was. Uh, uh, you, you know, I knew very very soon after I joined there that. Uh, this was something I really wanted to do, uh, and I, uh, I I worked really hard, and I bothered, uh, I bugged uh, my employers there to uh, to, to uh, please hire me back as uh, uh, as a first year uh, lawyer, and I was lucky enough to get hired back and spent, you know, the way it is, it tends to be with uh, at least with the federal government is you get hired for on a three month contract. And then after that, you know, they'll kind of look around and see if there's anything in the budget for another three months and then another six months. And, and I sort of went down that track for a few years until I was eventually hired permanently. Um, and I've been uh, uh, with, uh, with the PPSC ever since then. I got started early. I was uh, sort of recruited into working on a large scale securities fraud case that went on for a number of years and was basically my whole career for the first six or seven years of my 
career was working almost exclusively on this one large scale securities fraud case, which then uh, led to me having a, a real interest in that kind of work. Uh, and since then, I've, I've been mostly able to focus on white collar crime, fraud, and tax evasion and that type of stuff. But um, yeah, I don't know that I can uh, explain to students, this is what you need to do if you want to get into criminal law. But uh, uh, you, what I've found in my career is that uh, most of the steps that got me to where I was were surprising to me and not necessarily what I was planning. So that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I definitely don't think your story is um, out of the norm for some of the students these days. I always find it interesting to hear from them um, and what they had originally planned to do following high school and, um, and now they're in law. So um, I think you will have some very helpful insight uh, to some of our attendees tonight. Um, and last but not least, once again, we have Sarah or the second Paul Shepard of the evening. Um, hi, so it's really nice to hear everyone's background stories because I work in and around, well, at least the Nova Scotia people, and I, that's all new information to me. So, and I guess a little bit like Scott, Scott this is almost embarrassing. So before I went to law school, I was going to do a master's of fine arts in painting. <laughs> but I think I realized maybe a little earlier before I committed that I wasn't likely to succeed as a painter or to be an artist. And I thought, well, I can do that as a hobby on the side. And when I was in law school, I didn't even take any criminal law classes because I thought I was going to do immigration and refugee law because I'd been doing some volunteering at the clinic. Um, and then I couldn't get any articles. Uh, and so I did. We, there's a shared article thing that people are probably do more often now. And so you do. Uh, I did three months in four different places. And I was still kind of feeling like I'm not sure really where I fit in a lot of these you know, I spent some time at McGinnis Cooper and working with a really great guy there, but everybody seemed like not like me and really stiff. And so I have this day that I knew that I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer. And I was in the Dartmouth Provincial Court, which is like this dingy, gross old building. And I walk into the Barrister Society room and there's this big group of loud women defense lawyers. Um, and they're all like laughing and talking and I start to listen to what they're talking about. And they're talking about this client who had done something ridiculous and he had hooped a gun, which I didn't know what it was at the time. And so they explained it to me and I don't know why, but when this happened and I met all these loud kind of outspoken women, I just thought like, these are my people, <laughs> like, this is where I'm meant to be. Um, and so from there, I went on and started working. I, I worked at Legal Aid for a little bit, and I was tempted by the complex criminal files. I had some colleagues that were doing murder files, and I thought, you know, if I want to be a criminal defense lawyer, there was an older lawyer that I worked with, and he said, if you, you're not a real defense lawyer until you've done a murder file. And so I talked to him the other day, I did my first homicide file as like, as the primary, I did some second chairs before that uh, last fall. So I finally felt like a call and say, I'm officially a defense lawyer now, but it took 10 years. Um, and so I worked at Legal Aid, did some stints at the Dow Legal Aid Clinic and in private practice, working with some great, honestly, all male lawyers, male defense lawyers that I've been working with, but uh, I've had some great mentorship with them and decided to kind of do things my own way since the pandemic, it was really just going to be a temporary thing to work from home. Um, but I think Judge Buckle can relate when you have a family and kids at home, the work from home piece and having your own practice, I realized that I can work half as hard and make twice as much as billing whatever I was supposed to bill downtown. Um, and so that's what I've been doing, working at home. That's great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I, I know that most of us definitely aren't um, unfamiliar with the work from home life, but it's interesting to see how you sort of uh, let that shape your career now into something that you're you're really happy with. Um, so getting into some of the questions that I've sent around um, earlier. Um, so just a little bit of background. Last semester, uh, the DCLSA held a non-traditional careers in criminal law panel. 
Um, and that was looking at different uh, people in the community who practice around criminal law, but um, not in the roles that um, we typically think of like defense, crown and judges. Um, and with those non-traditional roles, I feel as though it's more likely that people will see social justice and criminal justice issues dealt with in those realms rather than in the traditional realm. However, I wanted to um, get the panelists uh, input um, and insight on whether you have a lot of room or what sort of freedoms you have in fighting for criminal justice issues um, in what's your traditional uh, criminal law career. And anyone can jump in on this one if you feel comfortable answering. Well, if we want to go in the same general order, um, you know, as a provincial court judge, it's limited. I'm not the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, I have to apply the law so I can interpret it and I can stretch it a little bit. And certainly in areas maybe of sentencing or uh, charter litigation, I can nudge the law in the direction that I think it should go, but I can't make law. Um, you know, even in sentencing, I'm constrained by the principles of sentence and the cases that have come before me, um, the, the stare decisis. So I, um, I think probably in terms of social justice movement, you have more of that when you're uh, an advocate before the court or when you're on the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada, because they you know, are more able to actually make law. If something new comes before me that hasn't been considered before, then I get to have the first crack at it. Um, but that's pretty rare. Mostly for me, it's just uh, applying something to, some, to an individual and trying to do something that might have a tiny little positive impact on that individual's life rather than thinking that I can make a stamp on the law in general. And I definitely don't think uh, overlooking the impact on the individual um, is something that we should do. I, I think that's absolutely um, crucial uh, in our society. Um, I'm curious to hear from uh, perhaps one of our crowns um, on this issue and um, how you feel you can, if you can, um, address criminal justice issues. So the short answer is absolutely you can and you should. Um, I went into, I'm a very much a, a systems thinker and I went in, as I said, I went into law to make changes for um, a marginalized community. And um, it really wasn't, a, it's never been an option to not be trying to make change. But I think it's important to remember that these systems have existed for centuries they don't like to change. The people who created them, uh, lawyers, don't like to change. Um, and so, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you can't change it, but I think it's really important in the early stages of your career to understand the system as it is. And that was certainly my strategy in coming to the Crown's office um, was to spend those first few years learning the fundamentals because as, as much as I may want to change everything in a minute, the system is probably going to be largely the same as it is by the time I retire. And so I need to really understand that current system and get good at it. And I, I also think there's something to be said about, you know, understanding how it works, all the different roles that are a part of it, understanding the challenges that everyone else is facing in, in making changes um, and, and building those, those fundamental skills um, and building your reputation to do that. Um, if you're a person who's indigenous or black or otherwise coming from an equity deserving community, I also think you need to take those early years to build your resiliency. Um, and your reputation is even more important. Um, we are held to a, a higher standard um, than other um, people. And so um, being able to, you know, whether we like it or not, when, when we screw up, um, that is sometimes unfortunately held against our entire community. And when we're successful, we are sometimes seen as an exception. And so I think building the, that strong base is really important, um, you know, that's not, it doesn't give me pleasure to say that, but I, I just think it's acknowledging the reality. But since coming to PPS, I am happy to say that um, 
am proud to say that I feel like I have made some significant changes in our organization. Um, you know, I am the primary author of PPS's uh, Policy for Fair Treatment of Indigenous People in Criminal Prosecutions. It's the first policy of its kind in Canada. I'm currently co-authoring um, or co-authored a policy um, with my colleague Dave Curry um, on a similar policy, but for African Nova Scotians and people of African descent. And that's all about guiding crowns, crown discretion. Um, the role of the crown is to serve the public interest. And I try since I started to um, deliver training on crowns to help crowns understand that um, to do that, to fulfill that role, we have to have an understanding of the diverse public that we serve. Um, that I think, uh, you know, for us to see changes in um, that come from cases like Gladue and now Anderson, um, the, cro the Crown plays a fundamental role in that. And I think we have a long way to go in truly fulfilling that, in truly playing our part um, in decarceration of Black and Indigenous people. And so, um, you, uh, there is absolutely space to do it, but it is very hard. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it is very, very hard. And so, um, and it's a long game. It's a very long game, but I, I think it is rewarding and there is so much room to do it. And I, uh, and there's room to do it in the, in the defense bar as well. I mean, we all have to grow those we're in. We're facing the challenges we are in society because of the role all of us play, um, and the individuals that we we uh, individual decisions that we make. Um, so, uh, I would encourage people who are innovative and and think about system change to consider a career in criminal law. Um, we need uh, lots of people with those big ideas. I really appreciate that perspective, Josie, thank you. Um, I think a lot of us forget that um, a lot of times like we are working against a system that's just so strong and um, so set in its ways that um, we feel like we're failing when we're really making small waves uh, that could eventually turn into something bigger. So thank you. Um, Justice Oregon, I see that you're unmuted. Um, so if you don't mind me picking on you next sure, sure. <laughs> for your perspective. My court is, is primarily uh, an error correcting court. And and we're restrained in terms of when we can intervene, in terms of judicial uh, intervention in the lower courts, and we're restrained obviously by what the Supreme Court of Canada says. But there are many more opportunities to change the law, clarify the law, develop the law. Um, and when I got the job, I thought I would be doing a lot of that. But what you learn very early is, and when you're with senior judges, we sit in panels of three, People are reluctant to do that. They're reluctant to decide anything that doesn't need deciding in that case. Uh, and there's good reason for that because, you know, six months later, somebody hands you a decision, you go, what was I thinking, right? Because I didn't anticipate the facts of this case. And what I said was just too broad. And they say, well, you know, you said this is the rule. And, and then you kind of, so that gets uh, that tendency to try to, go too far, it, it leaves you probably within a few months of coming to an appellate court. But there are times when you when you don't have any choice, right? When, when really the issue is, do we go this way or do we go that way? And that is a very interesting time uh, for an appellate judge. You have to be cognizant of the positions of, of your fellow judges, whether you're going to be in the minority or majority. Um, and you do feel that you can you can do a great deal for for the development of the law that you, that you you come to a decision where uh, you think people in the future will benefit and, and, and it, it's terrific and and I've also had the same feeling when I I don't dissent very much but there's times when I've dissented on cases and I've said you know I, I don't think so I, I I can't agree with my colleagues uh, we have a respectful discussion. But there's a point that I think they're missing or a point where I think I have a different view. And, you know, then we send it up to Ottawa and we see what happens. Uh, but even that's that's terrific, too. So it happens for us, but it's not day to day. It's not, you know, what you think an appellate judge would do uh, on a regular basis. Uh, but when it does happen, it, it's it's quite rewarding. 
Thank you for that. I can definitely see in your role and also in Elizabeth's role too, how it's uh, definitely a difficult balancing act. I think that needs to happen when it comes to addressing those issues. Um, perhaps before we move on, uh, maybe we'll just get some insight from our defense, either from Paul or Sarah. Um, I understand that perhaps from the defense side, there may be a little bit more wiggle room um, to do a little bit more in this area, but um, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'll jump in and do this one because my, <laughs> it's like a tension in my house. My partner's also a lawyer and he's, uh, I call like a black and white lawyer. Like this is the law, you have to follow the law and here's what you have to do. And I'm more of like, I don't really like that law. I don't think it applies in, for me in this circumstance. And I think the reason is because of the client base that we deal with. So I deal with a lot more chronic offenders and people who are in and out of the justice system all the time. And so a lot of our laws don't, our laws don't work for those people like denunciation, deterrence, all of the, a lot of the principles that we use don't, are, are ineffective when you're dealing with that group of people, depending on who it is. And so I've had a lot of fun uh, working with chronic offenders and trying to find creative solutions to problems that are not jail, because that tends to be the last result when you fall down to the bottom of the system. It's like, well, you keep doing this, so we're gonna go go to jail for this couple months, then come out and then they do it again, and then you go back to jail. And then, you know, I have one client who's one of my favorite clients who we did, we did this for like five or six years. And so finally, by the time we got to five years, I was like, okay, that's it, we gotta do something else. And so um, him and I made a plan and we had like a checklist and we're like, we're gonna start, uh, ultimately our plan was to sue the Department of Justice, the province, uh, for mistreatment of the section 15 claim because he has he's a disabled person but to do that we had this long checklist and so we went through the whole checklist and you know we kept getting the door slammed in our face at every avenue and we laughed because we got to the last one and it was kind of the bottom of his criminal piece and we were joking as like, okay after this one after we lose this one like we're gonna get you some money we're gonna start suing the government but what happened was the government started talking to us and then they gave him some funding for a great program. And so while we didn't get to have our big day in court, uh, we were able to creatively solve that problem for that one person. It's too bad you couldn't do it for everybody, but at least this one person got access to the resources that they needed. And they are one year, no criminal charges for the first time in like 35 years or something this year. So, you know, it's nice, knock on wood. So I told him if he stays sober for 10 years, we'll get him a pardon and then we'll take him to New York to go see like a Rangers game because this person really likes hockey. Um, so knock on wood because, you know, the road to recovery is long, but, you know, you do get to work with people that become very special to you when you're a defense lawyer and not everybody is like that, but when those you know, when you connect with those people, it gives you an opportunity to be creative and have lots of frustration as well. But, you know, when you have success, then it's really meaningful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, can, I I just, can I jump in on that? Yes, please. Because I think, you know, we're talking about all this stuff and what I don't want the students to miss is how rewarding this work can be. Um, I'm sure being a crown is as well for different reasons, but when I, you know, as a defense lawyer, I've never done anything that mattered so much to people other than being a mother. I got a letter recently um, from the mother of a client I represented probably 10 years ago. So just not long before I went to the bench, she wrote me a letter uh, to say it was sort of New Year's and she was reflecting on things. She sent me a picture of her son whom I'd represented with his wife and child. They're living in Ottawa now. He has a PhD, they're all doing very well. And she wrote me this beautiful letter about how she was thinking about me and reflecting on how much I had you know, done and essentially that she has a grandchild. It, it was over the top, but just um, like what a gift that is to have that kind of relationship with someone, even if it's only one a year that you, you can do something for, whether it's as a crown or a defense lawyer, or, you know, even as a judge, I get letters sometimes from 
you know, from young people, especially that I've dealt with, or someone who I uh, gave a break to on sentence, who will send me a little note or something, <laughs> um, you know, years after, because they feel that their lives have been improved. So like, I think the people listening need to understand that pursuing this as a, as a career is really meaningful and it may not be as lucrative as many other areas of practice and it's hard and it takes away from your family life and it's stressful and it's traumatic and all that stuff, but it's, it's also really worthwhile. Well, if I wasn't already sold on criminal law, I think that would have sold me right there. Uh, so maybe um, just in relation to that, Elizabeth, um, I just want to touch on um, perhaps students that may be worried, um, students who want to pursue a career in criminal law, and really that's their main focus, um, are worried um, about entering the field at all, um, despite the fact that Dal has one of the strongest criminal law programs um, in the country. Um, what students find sometimes is that um, there tends to be a push towards more of like the Bay Street or the um, like the business law careers. Um, so I was hoping perhaps from the panelists, if you could describe uh, some of the benefits that you found um, in working in areas of law um, other than criminal law before um, your role now. Paul, I know you had mentioned um, working in the family law division for a bit. Do you know if that contributed to any of the skills or experiences that um, that you have now? Uh, you know, I think the biggest lesson I took for the year that I practiced family law was uh, that uh, it, it confirmed that I was in the right spot practicing criminal law. Uh, I, 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 it, it just did not, uh, it wasn't a good fit for me at the family courts. I think probably my biggest complaint was how relaxed the rules seemed to be. And for me that, in my mind, I, I felt more uncertainty going into hearings. Um, there were, you know, there was a greater chance I was going to be in front of maybe a judge I didn't have a lot of experience with. Um, I didn't know how that particular judge was going to apply evidential rules. Yeah, it just uh, it just wasn't a good fit for me. That being said, um, and, and building on some of the other comments here, it, it, that was still meaningful work. It is still uh, incredibly impactful on people's lives. Um, I suppose maybe that's another lesson that I took is. Uh, that's really why I'm in this. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I find, uh, I don't know the, maybe the word for it, but uh, um, I, I like the spot that I'm in knowing that I'm having a positive effect on the community that I live in. And in particular being a legal aid lawyer, um, helping you know folks from disadvantaged communities and marginalized communities. Um, and, uh, and just kind of going back to that, you know, just to touch on that last question, I think that's why, you know, being creative and innovative is so important uh, because, you know, these systems are not built, um, you know, to benefit folks from those types of communities. Um, so, it, you know, it's never lost on me that I'm in a, in a very powerful and privileged position to help folks uh, and to find positive change for, for communities, yeah. Um, Overall though, you know, experience, whether it was, you know, doing work for somebody on a labor employment file or going to, to, to family, all of that stuff, uh, you know, any experience you get um, advocating or litigating, um, I think no matter which courtroom you end up, what, uh, you know, settlement conference room you find yourself in, all of that stuff uh, helps you be, be better at this job, so. Thank you so much for that. Um, Scott, maybe I'll get um, your insight as well, just in your work uh, starting out in law and animal rights um, and perhaps how that's um, given you some skills in criminal law. Um, well, I never did, uh, I never was able to practice much uh, animal rights law. I did a little bit uh, of uh, volunteer stuff when I was in, uh, in law school. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I agree for the most part with what uh, with what Paul said, and and really more broadly that, um, and and I guess I uh, I'm an example of it, and Sarah's an example of it, and, and and Josie and everyone is to a certain extent is that you 
you know, one of the things that I find makes people really good at this job is interesting and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking like, meaningful life experience. Uh, you know, it's, um, and I, I find this uh, often with, uh, you know, when, when we have our article clerks coming through every year or when we have new lawyers coming in, uh, those that have, that have, have done something, anything other than been a student or been, you know, a, a one track towards being where I am today, they are almost universally uh, better equipped to do the work and better equipped to, uh, uh, I suspect, to do any kind of law, but uh, certainly this uh, kind of law, and, and maybe family law would be another example where it gets so deeply personal. Um, and I think just the, the uh, to, to bring some kind of broader meaningful experience to that is uh, universally an asset. Uh, I, I can't speak very much to whether having, you know, if you've done a few years uh, at Stuart McKelvey, that will help you to be a criminal lawyer. Um, the, the, the cynic in me suspects not, <laughs> but, uh, you know, well, on that point, one thing that I'll say uh, as well is, uh, and, a slightly different angle from from what Elizabeth was saying about the, the work that uh, that we do in the criminal bar is it, um, I think that the, the criminal bar here in Nova Scotia especially is uh, incredibly collegial and open and uh, for the most part everybody gets along very well I don't know some maybe others will disagree with me on that but when I compare it to uh, the, uh, the 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 civil side of things and what I know about the uh, you know the corporate world it's just a completely different uh, life and experience and the people that I know who work in the corporate law world um, for the most part they're just not as happy as us working in the criminal world so my advice is come straight to us uh, and you'll be rewarded. <laughs> I guess just on that point, then, for the students who do find themselves in 2L and articling roles in the corporate world, um, would you have any advice um, for them to gain experiences or to ask um, for different projects um, if their goal is to eventually move into the criminal law? Is that directed at me, Sierra, or, or is uh, that open sure. to everyone? If you want to answer it. Uh, sure. Well, I... Uh, in terms of if you're already in law school, um, you know, one of the things that, and I'm sure I, I'm certainly not the first one to, to say this, uh, I know everybody hears it all the time, but um, do the legal aid clinic or do the criminal clinic. Uh, there was nothing, uh, nothing at law school for me that even remotely approached the rewarding experience that the, that the Dow legal aid clinic was for me. Uh, you, you know, it, it really was by uh, a wide margin the most uh, rewarding thing that I did at the school, the most memorable thing that I did at the school, and the thing that actually taught me some real things about how to be a lawyer in a way that no class did. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, other than that, I mean, I guess you know, if, if you don't end up, and I know, it, you know, if you, if you come to the end of law school and you, and you don't end up with an articling position or you don't end up with something, you know, uh, and you haven't, you know, you're, you're someone like many people who have come, you know, straight up through high school and undergrad and, and straight to law school, get out and do something else. You know, I, I really do think that, that, that the breadth of experience, and it's, it's obviously, you know, uh, incredibly easy thing for me to say uh, at this stage of my career you know now that you've just come out of law school and you don't have a job and you have sixty thousand dollars in student loan debt uh why don't you go see the world you know uh but it, it, I, I do really think that you know any kind of sort of broad life experience is uh, a really good 
uh, a, a real benefit. And to the extent that you can get that in law school, one area where you can do that is in the clinics. And the legal aid clinic is the one I did. Uh, I've heard great things about the criminal clinics. And I think there are a couple more now that, that, that didn't exist at the time, but I very, 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 very highly recommend them. I would also say like for, um, for folks who may not already know this for the, for the students, the, the Schulich Law School has a number of different um, internship programs where you, if you find the person who will supervise you or take you, Dow will pay your salary for the summer. Um, I didn't know they existed until a young, uh, a young uh, person, I shouldn't say young person, uh, like a student, um, cold emailed me out of the blue and said, I want to do an internship doing human trafficking and come work for you and you don't have to pay anything. And I was like, well, PPS will like the sounds of that. And yes, you can do it. And um, she did all of the paperwork to do it and and came and worked at, with us for a a summer and I, you know, did, uh, took her on every human trafficking thing I could think of to take her to. And, um, and uh, I've also had students who, who couldn't find articling positions right away, um, you know, reach out to people. Um, you know, the, the, it's amazing how many of us can get to know people. And if you're volunteering, and I, again, I hate to even say that because I know times are tough and push and cost a fortune. Um, but I've had people who just have said, can I just come and shadow at court? Um, you know, I, I don't have a job for the summer yet. Um, and I just want to get experience and, and have come. And then I will reach out to people I know to try to help that person find jobs. And I can actually attest to their to their skills. And, and I mean, I'm going to give the most amazing reference to someone who is that keen to work in that area. Um, so there, there are lots of different creative ways. But at the end of the day, um, as Scott was saying, like, you know, just, you know, do something, um, get a job doing anything and, and pay your bills, um, you know, find something to keep you, keep you going and it will turn up. And, and so what I would say is I don't know how, if every area of law will be useful to criminal law, but it won't exclude you from criminal law. Um, I have so many colleagues who have come from civil practice and or solicitor work um, and have turned out to be great crown attorneys and, or great defense lawyers. Um, so it just won't, it won't exclude you from that role. Um, you just need to get it done. Like you just need to get your articles. You just need to get um, those basic requirements done and, and you'll figure it out from there. I, I, can, I can tell you that you will. And I really think that that's a testament um, to the collegiality of the bar here in Nova Scotia. Um, even in just my three years of law school, um, you see the same names coming through, um, you build the connections and, and people do really look out for each other here. So it's been really nice to learn. Um, Sarah, I know that you have to jump off in a couple of minutes. So perhaps do you want to um, offer some closing thoughts uh, about your career, uh, maybe in terms of work-life balance and if that's achievable? Um, career, my career is just getting started. Um, I still feel like a baby lawyer. Um, this really um, great senior woman lawyer who's now retired told me one time, she said, zero to five, you're just running around, you don't know anything. And then she said, five to 15, like you get this weird confidence and you think you know everything, right? So I like that I'm, I'm not actually living there, but I'm feeling a little bit more confidence. But then she said, you know, 15 plus, you realize you don't know anything at all. So law is a marathon. It's not a race. It's a long game. You know, if you want to have a family, there comes a point where you realize, you know, being Marie Hennon and having your kids also be in bail court is probably not going to be great. So like you got to put some time in to raise those humans if you're going to have them. And that's... Um, you know, not everybody does that, but that's the situation that I'm in. And so um, if you can make it work, there, there is a point. And when you have a family that you have to focus less on career and more on family, unless you have a wonderful partner or person who's going to stay home and can do that, which so many people do have, and those people are lucky. Um, I don't have one of those. So work-life balance, before I, the pandemic really changed my perspective on this. And so 
you know, that was hard for a lot of people, but for our family, we kind of had this realization of why are we both, you know, working these 80 hour weeks and not spending enough time with these humans <laughs> that we have created. <laughs> so the pandemic was kind of a nice uh, circuit breaker and uh, that's changed my perspective on things now. Now I think I'm doing my master's. I'm looking long game in law for me. I anticipate I'm gonna have to do this for the next 20 to 30 more years. Um, so I think, you know, you have to always be learning and always trying to keep your eyes open and realize that even at, you know, as a judge of the court of appeal, there's probably lots of things that you feel you learn new things every day. And so uh, it's a really fun and rewarding career. Criminal law, I love it. You have to love it to do it because if you don't, you'll be miserable. And so, um, but if you, if you love it, you're gonna have a very rewarding and long career. It's not gonna happen fast. I think that's the most frustrating thing when you come out of law school because probably all of you in law school, everybody's very intelligent and you've been succeeding all the way through high school and university and then you get to law school and then you get dumped in practice and you realize you're at the bottom of the pile. And it doesn't take like one or two years to get really good. It takes like 20 years to get good. So it's a long game and just enjoy it and take your time and take in what you can and have a life outside of law too, because there's more to life than law. So good luck, everyone. That's all Thank I've got. You. I've got a bunch of 11 year old girls out there like yelling, like they want me to go out and coach them basketball. So, you know, you can do both all of those things. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. I really appreciate your insight. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Um, and Elizabeth, it looked like you wanted to jump in. Um, did you want to go back to um, perhaps the benefits of working in areas other than criminal law for students um, or maybe a comment on the work-life balance possibilities? Uh, I don't have much to say about working in other areas because I've never done that. <laughs> I've only ever done criminal law. Um, but I, I would echo what other people say, just get yourself into court or on your feet, whether it's in front of a tribunal, do whatever you have to do to get comfortable speaking in front of people. And this has nothing to do with the question, but take evidence in law school. It should be a mandatory course. If you want to be a litigator, if you want to be a criminal lawyer, take evidence, take evidence, take it twice, read the book. Um, Work-life balance is tough. I mean, I'm I'm at a different stage in my life. My kids are both in university. Uh, doesn't mean that they don't require my attention from time to time, but it's not the same. So when I first started in Toronto, I didn't have kids. And so work-life balance, like work was kind of my life. I know that sounds sad, but um, my friends were crowns in defense. We had a fantastic time. Like I didn't begrudge the hours because it was all so exciting. Like if I was asked to, you know, spend the weekend trying to find a bite mark expert, to me, that was just, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. It, it felt like a dream. You know, every day I walked into Old City Hall, I felt like, I don't know, I felt like I was on TV. I loved it. Um, it's harder once you have kids and if you want to do private practice. I was, you know, you don't have paid vacations. You don't have sick time. Um, when I was practicing, when I moved back to Halifax, there weren't, I think I was the only, there was one other woman in private practice in Halifax. Um, there were female crowns and female legal aid lawyers, but there was only one other woman in private practice. She's now on the Court of Appeal in Nova Scotia. But when she got appointed, you know, there wasn't anybody I could really talk to about how to, how to do all that. So I had, you know, I had backups to my backups to my backups because if the kids were sick and couldn't go to school or, you know, we had a in-home care, if the nanny was sick, I couldn't not go to work. That's just not an option. Or like it wasn't at that time. I, I couldn't imagine caught contacting the court and saying, I'm sorry, I can't do that trial. Um, my kid's sick. It just, it's not an option. So if you're going to do it and you're going to have children, you're going to have to figure out some way to make all that work because especially as a defense lawyer if you've got a client they have to have their trial you know maybe they're in custody or something so you do have to work that out 
um, I'd be interested in hearing what some of the younger lawyers have to say, because maybe it's changed a bit. Maybe there's better models out there now. I, I don't know. If I could just uh, hop, I, I found this this year to be, or I should say this this last year since we've been back, uh, I've, I've got two two young children, two and four. My wife works in healthcare. Uh, the balance has been really tough because there's so much um, there's so much sickness out there. And there are only so many sick days for people. Um, but um, yeah, but but uh, Judge Buckle is right. I mean, you, you really do need to find that balance. I mean, having uh, I hope none of this discourages anybody from 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 having a family. It's extremely rewarding to do. Um, but uh, I think, as Judge Buckle pointed out there, it's, you know, uh, very important issues in people's lives that you're going to be dealing with. If somebody is in custody and, uh, you know, for example, you, you had a sick kid, like, um, you know, you would have to, I think you would probably have to figure out a solution or at least try very hard to do so. Um, I'm fortunate, um, you know, um, m my wife works in healthcare. She does have some sick time. We're able to balance uh, things. Um, I'm also fortunate that I've, you know, I, I work with a wonderful uh, uh, office full of other lawyers who, who, uh, who can step in and assist from time to time. Um, but it is, it's definitely a challenge, but, uh, but, you know, not so much a challenge that, you know, that it should discourage anybody from uh, trying to have a family and, and do this work as well. I don't have um, kids. I'm not a kid person, but uh, um, I would say when you're first starting out in criminal law that uh, I don't think you should have an expectation of work-life balance. And again, that's not to discourage anyone from doing it, but um, to, in my view, and this is just my opinion, but to meet your ethical duty of competence in criminal law, um, where the stakes are high, like you're talking about liberty for an accused, wrongful convictions, like that's a, uh, you know, we all, this is the province of Marshall. And so um, that to me weighs heavily on on the decisions um, that I make and what I do. And and then also public safety and the impact you could have on a, um, a case for a complainant or a witness. And, um, and uh, but I never, I, I get like, I, I'm the same as Judge Buckle. Like those first, when I started as a, it was different when I was a defense lawyer working at the clinic because it, th that is just a different environment, I would say, um, than I think working as a legal aid lawyer um, or someone in private practice. And then as a crown, like you're carrying 200 to 300 cases. And so um, to read every case, every piece of disclosure, um, to try to think about every legal issue when you're starting out, like, you know, nothing like it's, I can't emphasize enough, a little, I knew when I started and I just, I just lived at the office, but like, you know, judge, judge Bucko was saying, I just, every day was like, this is the coolest thing. Like, I cannot even believe that this is my job, that you know, something would happen in court. I was like, this is wild. Like, you know, this is, this is everything I could have ever expected it to be. So it was worth it. Um, but it, I, it was, there was no, I, I mean, I, I, again, similar, like your friends are the people that you're working with. And, um, I, you know, I started off as a crown in, in Yarmouth. And so my, my friends were, you know, other crowns, defense lawyers, court clerks, sheriffs, like the people in a, in a small community are really, really close, but, um, you know, it, it's, so in the beginning, I feel like I had, it was all work, um, with, with a, a small social life and then it got a little bit better after those first three three years um but I agree with what Sarah was saying I don't know who told her that but that is bang on I feel like I knew nothing for the first five years then I felt like I got a little bit more confident um and then now I'm at the 15 year mark and I've never been less confident in my career um and I think it's just because I realized how little I really do know like I like the you know it's so um I had a, I, I feel like a good work-life balance like for a couple of years, <laughs> couple of years. Um, now I'm sort of back to um, it's just a, it's a lot I think uh, but I, I it's it is so interesting it is so rewarding it is 
all of the things in society is coming together. And I, and I, when you're doing provincial court, um, you know, provincial court is the people's court and it's, I, I look at them as you know, provincial courts are community centers, their workplaces and their classrooms. It's where everything is happening. And um, I can't imagine a more interesting place to be in the practice of law. I, I, so I don't regret any 80 hour week, any 20 hour day. <laughs> <laughs> don't regret any of it. Um, it's been a it's been a blast. Thank you so much for that. I I feel as though a lot of students sort of have somewhat of an understanding that you don't enter law to have, you know, all the free time in the world outside of work. Um, but it is nice to hear that if you are in something that you're passionate about, um, that it does help with that balance. Uh, before moving on to the next one, Justice Morgan, I am curious to hear um, if there's any contrast between yourself and Elizabeth's uh, roles um, in terms of this issue. Well, I, I would just, uh, I don't have the experience of practicing criminal law, but let me give you the Bay Street experience. Uh, I found it funny when Sarah said that she was going to go coach basketball, because I did that for my son when I was a judge, but there was no way I could do that in Bay Street. On Bay Street, you have a certain amount of hours that you have to uh, bill. Everybody does. As a partner, you have to bring in work constantly. You have to collect on that work constantly. They expect you to be engaged and involved in the legal community. They expect you to be engaged and involved in the greater community. Uh, I can tell you it's not conducive to a work-life balance or raising kids at all. Um, and uh, so when my kids were at law school age, talk about how great it is to be a lawyer, my wife always says, yeah, you don't remember when dad was working 20 hour days. You don't remember when he couldn't go to this and he couldn't go to that. So, you know, I, I don't want to discourage people from practicing law, but I want them to be realistic and know that they have to make a decision about what's important. Nobody should do this for the money. We live in a country where you get to a certain amount of money and the government takes over half of it anyway. So, you know, these people who think they can go to Bay Street and make $2 million, yeah, there are people who do. I, you know, not many though. There are a lot of people who are struggling year in and year out to get clients to do work and they're doing work that they hate and it's just not worth it, right? At the end of your career to be in a position where you know, you, you put a few bucks away, maybe a little bit more than if you'd done something else, but hated every minute of it and didn't get a chance to see your kids as much as you should have. Well, that, that's, that's no choice at all. Um, so I always tell uh, students, what are you passionate about? Don't worry about the money. Like, the money will sort itself out. If you get more money, you'll pay more taxes, you'll buy more stuff. None of it will give you satisfaction. What is it you want to do? What is it you're passionate about? Uh, you know, the people who go to law school generally are very smart. They have keen interests in things. And that's what they have to develop. If that's criminal law, great. If you make money from it, great. But if, if you just, you know, provide for you and your family and you do something you find rewarding, to me, that's infinitely better than, you know, chasing the next uh, cottage in Muskoka or the next uh, Mercedes model and, and all of that. And I know this sounds trite. But it's something that I have learned over time. And a lot of us go from law school into the profession. We're very naive. We don't understand how it works. We don't understand the reality of the situation from an economic point of view. And, and I think people just really need to think hard about what it is they're passionate about and do that. Put the money aside. And if you're doing that and you're happy, if you find a way to make it work for your family, but you never give up family and passion just for money. That, that's a, a lesson that I, I say to my kids all the time. And uh, sometimes they listen to me, not often, but sometimes they do. So we'll, we'll see. Can I, just, can I just chime in on the sort of yes. practical world of, the, of um, criminal law? So unlike uh, Justice Horgan's experience, criminal lawyers for the most part are not hired and paid a salary. And that's a reality I think that a lot of law students aren't aware of and it's scary. So for instance, 
I was hired um, as an articling student and I was paid to be an articling student. That's great. I didn't make as much as my friends on Bay Street, but I didn't work as hard either. I didn't have the billing targets that they had and I had a lot more fun, I think. But after articles, for the most part, if you even if you join a firm as an, in an association, which is what I did, I, I had a job, but I was paid essentially a percentage of my billings. So uh, in my first year, I was paid basically a base. I was kind of given it like a guaranteed draw that would cover my rent and my car. Um, but what I earned was entirely dependent on uh, what I did and the bills I collected. So percentage of collected bills. And that's a really scary thought for a lot of people. And if you've got student debt, which I had, it's really frightening. But I don't think there's many other options out there. So if you don't, unless you're going to work for the Crown or a legal aid office like we have in Nova Scotia, because Ontario doesn't have um, a legal aid clinic system, you're going to have to probably work on that kind of model. The great thing about it is that if you work hard enough, you can earn a lot of money. And you can decide what you need to live and you're not, it's not a billing target that somebody else is setting for you. Um, so that, but that's a practical thing. Cause I know when I've tried to get associates to come and work for me, when I was um, at a, a, you know, a different stage of my career, it was very hard to find anyone who was prepared to work on the percentage of buildings. It's too scary. I just want to pause and say that this has been uh, really helpful just in terms of getting practical advice. Um, and I do find it interesting, um, just as we were talking about um, finding your passion, just the thought of when we're growing up and when we're younger, we're often asked, like, what do you want to do? Make sure you follow your dreams. And then that conversation sort of stops when you start university, I find. And it's the goal is to find a job. The goal is to pay off your debt um, and to be in a position to begin your family. So um, I really appreciate that in my last year of law school, I'm getting this advice from esteemed panelists who are telling me, like, do what you're passionate about um, and don't just do it for the money. Uh, so I think that's really refreshing. So thank you all for that. Um, I do have a question that wasn't in the prepared question. So I apologize if this takes you off guard. I'm just curious to see um, how each of you feel um, or how each of you approach an issue that comes before you where you might not agree, um, but it is your duty as a lawyer to, to push for that. I know that comes up in different contexts, um, sort of defending or prosecuting an issue that um, you might not necessarily agree with. This is somewhat personal for me as I'll be working um, in an area of child protection that sort of goes against the social justice work I've been doing in child protection. So um, almost just to get a background for myself. I think it happens all the time as a defense lawyer. I mean this is going to sound really, well, I'm just going to say it, uh, you know, nobody agrees with child abuse or, you know, or sexual assault or murder or rape, but you, you defend those people all the time. That's your job. So you, you're defending a principle and you're defending the rule of law and the right to a fair trial and all of those things. Um, so if you don't truly believe in those things, don't be a criminal lawyer. Uh, I think that includes don't be a crown. So if you don't really, really, really believe in the presumption of innocence and the requirement for proof beyond a reasonable doubt, don't do this because it you're, it's going to destroy you. And if you become a crown and you don't believe in it, you're going to feel like you're losing all the time and you're not going to understand why. And it's going to feel like you're beating your head against a wall. But if you believe in it, then you don't ever lose because you go into court and justice is done, right? I think when you go into career in law, you have to appreciate that it's not a perfect system, right? But it's better than everything else, right? And so I didn't do criminal work, but in civil side, I acted for a bunch of big corporations. Did I feel great at the end of the day, you know, with what I had to do every day? No, I didn't. Uh, as a judge, uh, there's law that's binding on me which I'm not thrilled that I have to uh, impose or follow, but I do, right? Because there's a bigger principle at stake. It's part of a system um, and you're a part of that. And you're never going to be able to make change, do things that are beneficial 
to society or, or to your community by saying, well, I'm, I'm just not going to take part in it. it. We're all part of it. So you've got to find your way to be comfortable with what you're doing so that you can do what you really want to do. And are there compromises? Are there days where you just shake your head? Yeah, there are, but that's the reality. I think um, uh, as a crown, there's a, there's a, there's, I think a fair amount of wiggle room because we do exercise a lot of discretion. Um, so, um, but I think it's really important to depersonalize it. So I think that um, to build on what Judge Buckle is saying, this idea that you're, there are just guiding principles that you have to get behind to be able to do the job. But I do think, um, what I think about, I think what's what's so interesting about criminal law and, and how, what it looks like and then what it, what how it's taught is that it's a lot more gray than you think it is. There's a lot more range than you think that there is. Um, it's very human, like it's very centered in the human beings who are doing it, which I, it's a very hard thing to teach. Like I, um, so students, well, you know, when you get new students, they're always like, how do you know what sentence to ask for in like a, like a low level, um, you know, property crime, like shoplifting or something like that. And they're like, do you research cases? I'm like, no, I, like, I just know sort of like what it's worth at this point. And, and I think that that, what you find when you're doing the job in the beginning, it, it will feel restrictive because you're just learning a lot and you don't quite know yet what the possibilities are. Um, but what I think is really great about criminal laws, I think all of the people who are going into it, and you could hear that tonight, are these really passionate people who are really interested in people and real life problems. And so building relations, it's amazing what you can do when you build really good relationships with the people who are working in that system, either as the defense lawyers or your court clerks or your sheriffs. I think people who are in criminal law are problem solvers by nature. And so there's more space, I think, in criminal law than in other things. Although, granted, I've not done, I don't have a lot of experience in other areas of law. Um, and then just with any job, like there's just going to be stuff that you don't want to do. Like, a, you know, um, and then you just do it. But you know that like the next day there could be something really interesting. Um, that, that you can that you can change um but i again those systems are like they're they're, they're long-standing systems so i think you do have to get get used to doing stuff that you may not agree with but you know over time or the i guess stacked up and over the life of a career i think that there will be more days where you feel like um you got a chance to do something interesting again this is coming from a crown perspective because we do have a lot of discretion um then then uh there's more good days than there are bad days by far more moments of where you feel like you've got wiggle room than there is not thank you for that Josie um I would hope that you would have more good days than bad um seeing your your lengthy career in this um so that that does make me uh feel very hopeful uh, for the future um so we have uh probably just around 20 minutes left, um, and I'm not sure how long this will take, but perhaps as some uh, final closing thoughts, um, if the panelists have any comments on um, your career journey and perhaps any regrets that you have, uh, maybe any opportunities that you wish you had pursued or opportunities that you pursued that um, perhaps maybe you wish you hadn't. Um, Scott, let's start with you. I haven't heard from you in a little bit. Uh, I regret not having become a poet. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's it's a really good question. I mean, the, you know, I, I as I said, I, I really fell backwards by pure accident uh, multiple times into where I am today. So I can't say, you know, I made this decision and it got me to this place and I wish I'd made some other decision that got me somewhere uh, else or, or got me here in a different way. Um, it's, uh, 
you know, I can say that uh, I can't imagine, and I do say this frequently, and, and um, uh, that I just can't imagine a better job in law than the one that I have. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's interesting to hear, you know, especially uh, Judge Buckle, what you had, were saying about just how rewarding it is to, uh, um, to, you know, to represent certain individuals and to make those kinds of connections and to really help people. And, and, and I will say, you know, that is not so much an experience uh, that, uh, that crowns good. I've I've never gotten a letter from you know a, a CRA investigator thanking me for my wonderful work on his tax evasion investigation. But uh, as, as as much as I enjoy doing it, uh, but it really, um, you know, I think uh, working as a, a, a federal crown prosecutor has so, so many benefits to it. Uh, one of, you know, some of them very practical. I mean, the other thing that we don't have is any concern about, you know, chasing clients or billing or, or any of those issues. Uh, and, you know, I, I see the job of, of, of a defense lawyer, which I've never been, so that's a rather large uh, um, a caveat as, to me, it's a, you're, you're a lawyer, you're a social worker, you're an accountant, you're a bill collector, and all in one. And, and I don't know that my mind anyways is, would, would be able to properly compartmentalize all of that. But when you work for um, the, the, the Crown's office, and especially for the federal Crown, uh, uh, all we do is law. That's all we do. It's the only thing I have to think about is the thing that I have come to uh, really love and be passionate about. And so it, it really allows us a lot of space to focus on that one thing. And that's what I really love about it. I don't think I'm answering your question at all, uh, Sierra, but uh, I, I, as a closing remark, I do want to make a pitch for that, that it's, uh, you know, it, it came as a, a great surprise to me how much I enjoy this work and how much, uh, you know, and how rewarding it is uh, uh, to me, and um, I, I highly recommend it to anyone uh, out there who's listening, and not just federal crown work, but the criminal law work in general uh, here in Nova Scotia. It's, uh, it, it really is a great, great career path, and I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't change any of the many happy accidents that got me. You absolutely did answer my question, so no worries there, Scott. Thank you for that. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in on um, any opportunities um, that they feel like they missed out on or um, that they're really happy that they took? Um, um, oh, I'll, sorry, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, de I'll defer to Justice Oregon. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all I will say is this. Uh, when I interviewed at Faskins, uh, a very senior litigator there who was from Hamilton, and he knew I was from Burlington, which is right next door. And he said to me, you can always go back to Hamilton, but you can't start in Hamilton and come here. And I thought to myself, why would I want to go to Hamilton, right? Like Toronto was it, and I had it in my head that this was the center of the universe, and, and this was where the best work was and everything else. I compared my career to my father's. My father was a lawyer in Burlington when there was 10,000 people there. He was involved in everything, the hospital, you know building that, building the local football team, everything else. He had a community connection that I didn't have. And I didn't know I was missing it until I went back to Halton and I was a trial uh, judge. And I saw then that what I was doing was really impacting the community. I was connected in a way that I never would be in Toronto. Uh, and I'm connected on an individual basis too. I got a letter too one time, it was a card from uh, somebody who had appeared before me, we used to have basket motions for divorces. They're uncontested and you sign off, but I looked at it and I was very concerned about uh, this uh, woman's husband. He was very violent, there were two young kids involved. So I made uh, her lawyer come to court where I could ask some questions just to make sure that he was out of the picture and she was taken care of. And that was fine and I satisfied myself and so I signed off and probably in a week I would do a hundred of them. Right, wouldn't have them in very often, but just sign off. I then got a letter from her about two months later, and she said, You know, the whole system seemed to be against me. 
And when I found out I had to testify, I thought, oh, here it is again. My, my husband's going to win somehow. And she said, but no, you were really interested in my kids. And that meant a lot to me. And she said, I know you do this for lots of people, but here are pictures of my kids. And I want you to see them and see the impact you've had. That personal connection, the community connection that you get when you're, when you're practicing in the criminal field, when you're practicing in a small town, when you're at the small town court level, it's something that I never would have got if I'd stayed at A Street. And I'm glad that I did it because, as I said, it, it's much more important. So that's my pitch. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I think you're muted. It wouldn't be a real Zoom call without one mute. That's right, yeah. I'm not gonna turn into a cat though, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what, starting out, uh, you know, I'm just kind of reflecting on uh, Justice Morgan's uh, answer there. Um, you know, growing up, so I, I grew up in, in Cape Breton, sort of a rural part of Cape Breton. My parents were school teachers. I think for a long time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I often look to, to what my mom and dad were doing and I saw that they were, you know, helping people in our community and, uh, and through their work, uh, they had meaningful relationships with people uh, in our community. Um, and although I didn't become a, a school teacher, I think, I think I've sort of sought out that type of connection and, and meaning in my professional career. Um, there have certainly been times when I've looked at uh, what other classmates or or uh, or colleagues have have done and accomplished, and uh, you know, I, I suppose I'm I'm uh, maybe a little bit ashamed to say that I felt envy from time to time. Um, but you know what? I really like my job. I really like my job because it it makes me feel uh, like I'm doing something meaningful. Uh, that uh, you know, my work for for folks is strengthening the community for everybody here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there are times I've looked back about different decisions I've made professionally um, or, or while I was in law school and thought, you know, if I had, you know, just done X or Y, maybe things might have turned out a little bit brighter. But uh, um, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think I regret anything. I think I've had a, a, a meaningful path to where I'm at. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose now, looking back, if I, if I change something, I don't know where I would be. Um, and, I, and I'm content enough with uh, what I get out of my work and, uh, uh, and my community that, uh, yeah, I wouldn't change a single thing, I don't think. Sierra, I, I, um, I don't want to sort of end on a dark note, but I do want people to understand, I don't have regrets about what I did or where I am, but people have to understand that it's a hard job. Um, and it you can't do criminal law for 20 years and not have a little bit of scarring because of it. It's so if you know for people thinking about entering it, they have to think about that before they go in and they have to understand that um, it's going to touch you by the end of it. and and certainly now we have, I think a lot more appreciation of, vicarious trauma and things like that. But anyone who's done criminal law has been exposed to horrible, horrible, horrible things. And if you're someone who um, can't sort of do that and, and leave it behind in some way, then this is not the right job for you. But even with that, I still love it. No, thank you for that, Judge Buckle. I think um, we definitely need the realistic um, comments too, as well. We don't want to we don't want to paint a picture uh, for students um, about how nice and and fluffy this is. Um, and as much as they're interested in criminal law, like there there definitely is some some very real um, issues that can crop up for sure. So so I do appreciate that comment. Thank you. And just actually on that point, that's a good um, tie into the two two pieces of advice I would leave and I wish I would have done them sooner in my career is um, get a therapist and get a financial advisor um, and do it early. Um, that there is a significant amount of vicarious trauma uh, in criminal law and there's no shame in going to a counselor and the law society, there is counseling services through the law society. And 
um, I think people should talk about it more um, because it's it's even you know it's maintenance it's maintenance of of uh, strong mental health. Um, so I think that that's a good thing and having a place to process it because the last thing you want to do is bring that home to your family and your friends and um, traumatize them um, with the content that you have and most of the time you can't share it anyway. Uh, so. Um, so that's a good thing. And then the financial advisor piece, I say, just because if you're like me coming out of law school with $80,000 in student debt, and um, you don't make a lot of money in criminal law in the beginning, and uh, um, that if that's one piece of stress that you can take off of your shoulders is getting some good advice. Um, lawyers are not accountants. Um, and, uh, you know, we often, you see in our profession, we have high, you know, high rates of substance abuse and other types of addictions. And um, spending is associated with that as well. And so I think if the, anytime that you can give yourself tools um, to help with the things that you're that we're not good at, and and I think criminal law lawyers, as, especially, we have a tendency to think that we're we're like armchair psychologists because we're around so many um, challenging issues, but we're not. Um, and uh, and our colleagues are not either, even though we we'd love to sit around and, and share those war stories and probably no one will understand you better than your colleagues, but we're not, none of us are um, therapists. Um, so uh, no shame in doing that. So I would say like, connect with that. There's lots of uh, free options and connect with a financial advisor. And if you don't um, know one and you can't afford one um, and you can't find one for free, I highly recommend Gail Vez Oxlade's book, um, uh, books, any of her books, and that helped me get out of my student debt very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, those are two pieces of advice that I wish I would have had at the very beginning of my career. Um, but otherwise, I wouldn't do anything differently. Even with all of that, that, that tough content, um, I still think it's the most interesting area of law to practice in. I think it's the coolest, um, most interesting, most rewarding. Thank you so much for that, Josie. Um, we didn't really get into uh, the mental well-being of lawyers in criminal law in this panel, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, just in the clinic last week, uh, I'm in the Dalhousie Legal Aid Clinic this semester, um, and we were talking about the difference with um, addressing mental illness versus just maintaining your mental well-being. Um, and so I think having this said so explicitly from people who are so experienced in the criminal law field, um, I'm really hoping that students can uh, can take that advice to heart um, and really look out for, for ourselves um, as soon as possible. Um, so on that note, um, I don't see any comments in the chat, but if any of the attendees or people watching um, this panel later on with the link um, have questions, feel free to email um, the DCLSA at hotmail.com. Um, if there's any questions for a specific panelist, um, if the panelists agree here, um, I can forward that question on to them. Um, but just let us know and we'd be happy to do that. Um, and with that being said, I want to give an extremely large thank you to all six of our panelists that joined us here today. Um, it was extremely informative. Uh, we went into areas um, that I hadn't planned on going into, but uh, I'm really glad that we did. Um, I think it gave a very practical um, and realistic overview. Um, sorry, I just got a comment to, to link the email in the chat. So I'll make sure I do that quickly. Um, sorry, I usually have a, an admin person, but. <laughs> Perfect. So with that being said, um, I hope you all have a lovely evening um, joining the Nova Scotia Bar, hopefully next year, um, if things go as planned. I'm really hoping that I get to uh, be in connection with you, um, with any of you uh, later on. Thank, Thank you very much. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Same. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite.